My name is Solomon Gamboa. Uh, this is a presentation by Indigenous Landscapes. Indigenous Landscapes is a business in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, it began in 2013 and I went full time into it 2015. We mostly do invasive species removal, uh, prairie installations, native agricultural installations, also known as uh, indigenous agroforestry, uh, pollinator gardens, and a few other things. So today, um, I want to give a presentation on big picture pollinator biodiversity and conservation. I want to lay out some most effective actions and try to give us a nice big picture of what our ecosystems are facing and what we can do to best um, turn the tide. So these are basically the original ecosystems of the Midwest and upper Midwest. So that's Minnesota, down through Nebraska, all the way east to Ohio, um, even Kentucky in many ways. Um, and even Tennessee in many ways uh, is created or is um, had these ecosystems originally. So these are native prairies, open grasslands, glade prairies are more common in the east. Um, slope prairies as well, common in the east, as, as opposed to open grasslands, um, riverside prairies, wetlands, different types of wetlands, different types of savannas. Savannas are anywhere between 30 to 70 percent tree dominated and the rest is dominated by shrubs and prairie plants. Uh, woodlands are I think the definition is about 80% trees, um, so it's a little bit more uh, dense, tree dense than savannas, but less tree dense than forest. And then much of east of the Mississippi River was dominated by different forest types. So these ecosystems provide maximum pollinator and maximum biodiversity support from the bottom of the food chain to the top. So using these systems to biomimic for our restoration basically puts our best foot forward. Some call this using nature as your teacher. These ecosystems develop over millions of years to become the most sustainable landforms known to us. Uh, and what I mean by that is you can't really improve them if you're thinking about what can I do that is best for ecology. Um, trying to get back to something similar as these original ecosystems is the best we can do for the full ecological web. If we focus on one species over another, then you can alter these ecosystems to make it better for one species, but um, as a consequence, it often makes it worse for multiple other species. So here's a couple of conservation uh, concepts to keep in mind. These ecosystems can be restored, but not improved upon, which is the point I just touched on, as far as supporting biodiversity. The intricate web of life co-evolved over time to rely on these ecosystems. When humans seek to improve an ecosystem for one species or another, it will likely make it worse for many other species. When you're talking about, well, maybe if we plant just oak and hickory, it'll be like the best ecosystem for turkey and white-tailed deer. Uh, that may be the case, but the web is too complex. So if you improve it, or if you think you're improving it in this way for these species that you desire to be supported, in other ways that would be hard to even study, it'll be degraded uh, due to lack of diversity or lesser diversity, or just changing the ecosystem overall. Um, so it'll likely make it worse off for many other species. The system is just too complex and interconnected. Um, and that sounds overwhelming, but all it really means is just follow, uh, biomimic the original ecosystems and um, a maximum amount of biodiversity can be supported. So when it comes to reversing biodiversity loss, including pollinator conservation, uh, 
Um, it depends on large scale restoration of these ecosystems um, that have mostly been removed by agriculture. So items such as urban sprawl and lawns, they hold little weight when considering how little land these human uh, land uses occupy compared to agriculture. I want to talk about how we can use these lawns, um, which only occupy about 0.02% of the land in this country, as a place to influence change in our agricultural system that has so decimated the Midwest, which I'll show you in a couple of slides. So um, this is a picture from Andrew Lane Gibson. He's a pretty well-known botanist and photographer. Um, this is Bigelow, Ohio State Nature Preserve. It's only 0.5 acres. It was a pioneer cemetery, which um, spared it from being plowed. Uh, this is uh, a virgin grassland. I believe it was, it definitely was never plowed and I believe it was never grazed as well. Um, it also has a few bur oaks and maybe a couple other tree species. And uh, you'll see that on the next slide. So imagine this covering, this is the, called the tall grass prairie. Imagine this covering just hundreds of millions of acres throughout the Midwest. Uh, this is Bigelow Cemetery, uh, 0.5 acres, the same slide you saw. Um, and this uh, dark green square with the spaced out oaks is the nature preserve that was pictured on the previous slide. So when I visited this preserve two summers ago, it had about 10 hummingbirds just flying around. They were utilizing this, um, this red flower. It's called Royal Catch Fly, blooms mid-July. Uh, this tall grass ecosystem, tall grass prairie ecosystem, um, is part of the grassland, savanna, and woodland ecosystems that once supported millions of bison, wolves, birds of many types, rodents from prairie dogs, size to vole size and countless amounts of native bees and other pollinators. So uh, once again, when you're looking about how to restore the land, um, these are the types of ecosystems you would try to biomimic and recreate uh, for maximum biodiversity support. So um, this little Google marker right here um, is right above that 0.5 acre uh, prairie remnant. So if you can look, all these polygon figures around surrounding the area are different forms of agriculture. And there's little green strips of trees um, along the waterway that is Little Darby Creek. Uh, even some parts of the creek have no trees so it's unprotected there. <clears throat> Same place. Now you can't really see the nature preserve, but you can still see the marker because we've zoomed out a little bit. And all of this land surrounding uh, this 0.5 acre nature preserve has been completely turned into agriculture, as you can see by the light green colors. The darkest green colors are um, woodlots, fragmented woodlots. And these green streaks, they're just trees along waterways. Uh, but you can see 90, over 90% of the land is just agriculture. So as we zoom out even further, you can imagine um, what you just saw in this slide is all of the light green in all of these states. The Mississippi River floodplain, um, all this light green is agriculture. Um, Northern Missouri, mostly agriculture, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, all this light green is agriculture. Um, this part of Minnesota, agriculture, Wisconsin, Michigan here, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Um, and a lot of this has to do with it being very um, tillable land arable land. This, a lot of this region is glaciated, which created flat, deep soils. And once they figured out how to drain 
the wet prairies and the wetlands and how to drain the wet forested wetlands um, and um, how to uh, change these ecosystems into agriculture and plow the prairie. Uh, that's mostly what has become of the Midwest. And even in states, if you zoom in to North Carolina and South Carolina, uh, those are interesting because uh, I've never been to those states, but when I was looking at them on Google Maps, if you zoom in really close, uh, they're about 50% agriculture in some areas and 50% tree lots, which is interesting because the land seems to be flat. Um, and most flat land was uh, developed into agriculture at this point in time. Uh, but if you zoom in in North Carolina and South Carolina, for whatever reason, a lot of their agricultural land is about 50% woodlots and 50% um, tilled agricultural land. I'm not sure why that is, um, but it's interesting. So uh, this whole region here, um, this used to be those forests, wetlands, different types of prairies, and savanna ecosystems. And that has all been turned in, like over 90% of it has been turned into agriculture. And that's what we've lost. That is biodiversity decline. That is ecosystem displacement. And that is what we're going to talk about today. So what we can't do. We can't save biodiversity by turning every lawn into native vegetation. Lawn represents 0.02% of the land surface in the U.S. And if you count Alaska, which you don't really need to uh, because it's just a completely different environment than the U.S., um, it would be 0.01%. Uh, but for the purposes of this presentation, just think of it as 0.02%. Uh, but what we can do is we can use our lawns as a place for building an ag indigenous agricultural movement and places to nurture generations of future conservationists. Um, conservationists, people who are interested in nature, people who will do things for nature, people who will change their diets for nature. Um, those types of people that are listening to this presentation uh, don't come from nowhere. Um, they come from childhoods that have uh, created bonds with nature somewhere along the way um, that has formed an adult that will care for and act for nature, which is what we need more of in our culture. So the cultural value for creating interest is high in lawns due to the proximity of to it to our populations. 80% um, of our populations are on 3% of the land known as metropolitans and that's also where the majority of our lawn is as well. Uh, so due just to the proximity to the population um, it has a major cultural value if we were to use our lawns and our private property as places to uh, help create bonds and interest with the general population. Also, for uh, metropolitans, uh, metropolitans contain the highest concentrations of invasive plants. So, um, because due to, uh, due to horticultural introductions and the Department of Natural Resource introductions, and a high concentration of people planting these invasive plants, some of our more um, high quality nature preserves and uh, protected lands that are away from metropolitans, they have a lot less invasives. Uh, some of them, uh, nature preserves closer to metropolitans have a much higher invasion rate from uh, invasive plants. But if we can eradicate invasives within this 3% of metropolitan land, um, within this 3% of land that is metropolitans, we can greatly impact their spread outwards into larger expanses of land outside of metro areas. So metropolitan scale invasive removal is super important. It's like we're cutting the core out of populations of many invasive plants. 
If you notice when you drive from Cincinnati to Columbus or Cincinnati to Lexington or Cincinnati to Indianapolis, um, once you get away from metropolitans and you look at the woodlots that are out in those seas of agriculture, uh, those woodlots often, even though they have a lot of edge, which creates um, sensitivity or susceptibility to invasion from plants, invasive plants, even though they have a lot of edge, often the edges are just native plants like red buds and viburnums and wild plum and those types of native edge plants as opposed to invasive plants. Uh, but once you get closer and closer to another metropolitan, you'll notice that um, the buckthorn, the honeysuckle, the Japanese honeysuckle, and uh, Siberian elm, those types of aggressive invasive plants start increasing the closer and closer you get to metropolitans, uh, which indicates they spread outwards from metropolitans. Excuse me. So, uh, Metropolitan scale invasive removal is again like we're cutting out the core of populations of many invasive plants. Uh, it isn't really a matter of lack of people that we still are surrounded by invasive plants, a lack of people power. It's more of a matter of lack of interest, um, which comes from apathy towards and disconnection from nature. Just like changing agriculture requires a paradigm shift in our culture, getting the population involved in invasive species removal also requires people having interest in nature's well-being, or in other words, ecosystem health. Without this interest in nature, we lack care, compassion, we lack passion, and positive action, and mostly live in states of apathy or sometimes negativity towards nature. So a lot of this um, I just covered, but um, our, we'll recap. Our culture slash population lacks interest in nature, which creates apathy and an absence of proaction. Uh, this is what we experience today. There's a small group of people who really would like to be active on invasive plants and um, and there's a larger majority of people who are just disconnected and disinterested um, from the ecosystem. So what indigenous foods create is an opportunity for people to connect directly to our ecosystems, forming a healthy bond. Um, without systemic change in our culture, biodiversity has very little chance to recover. Our culture is what created the agricultural system or accepts the agricultural system. Um, it also is what's created the invasive plant dilemma um, and to an extent accepts the invasive plants uh, dilemma. Without changing our culture, um, these realities will be extremely hard to change. So um, you can revisit this slide um, through the recording if you want to read it, but we basically just covered that. So uh, what could indigenous agriculture offer? Native plant agriculture is what I like to call eco-inclusive. As we'll cover in later slides, fungi, bacteria, um, soil life, and insect life thrives amongst a diversity of native plants due to millions of years of coevolution, which has formed codependency between many species. Restoring this foundation of the ecosystem in agriculture allows for greater transfer of energy up higher into the food chain into native birds, reptiles, amphibians, and mammals, the types of animals we think of when we think of as uh, wildlife. Um, energy transfer from non-native plants up the food chain is significantly lesser in comparison, uh, creating less life productive degraded ecosystems. And all that means is um, our fungi, bacteria, soil life, insects, rodents, the basis of our native rodents at least, the basis of our ecosystem um, uh, 
and food energy transfer um, does not as effectively consume non-native plant parts uh, due to the lack of coevolution. So with non-native plant agriculture, there's a spectrum of what I call um, e uh, exclusivity. So eco-exclusiveness is what I would label non-native plant agriculture, which is basically 95% or 90% of our current agricultural system. On one extreme of eco-exclusivity, you have industrial agriculture, whose chemicals leave hundreds of millions of acres silent of even insect life each year. On the other end of eco-exclusivity, you have forms of organic agriculture that are still based in non-native plants, but more species, they're more other species supportive than industrial agriculture um, due to less toxicity to the foundation of the ecosystem, fungi, bacteria, insects, rodents, so on. Um, so when it comes to really any perennial base agricultural system, uh, these two, regardless if it's native or non-native, if it's a perennial base agricultural system, uh, there's two benefits of carbon sequestration um, and soil conservation when you compare it to industrial agriculture. Industrial agricultural is annual, plant-based, and even if it's no-till, the soil is often exposed um, for long periods during the winter and spring and fall, which is bad for soil conservation. Um, carbon sequestration, when the agricultural system is based on annual plants, there's less soil carbon sequestration and often less, um, well, it depends. So um, with corn, that produces a lot of my, a lot of biomass above ground. But then, um, what happens to that biomass uh, depends on carbon sequestration above ground. Uh, but with a lot of other plants like wheat and soybeans, uh, both above ground and below ground, um, carbon sequestration is significantly lesser uh, compared to perennial base agriculture. Uh, so those are just climate change uh, imp implications. Um, indigenous agriculture would be easier to manage organically due to ecosystem cooperation versus competition. Um, and these are not terms that you can just Google. This is just how I'm trying to explain these concepts. Um, so a native plant cooperates with the ecosystem. Insects, like I said, the foundation of the ecosystem, the soil life, fungi, bacteria, the insects in the soil and above ground, um, they're co-evolved with native plants. So most often these things do not decimate native plants. Um, they eat enough of them to survive and reproduce, but there's balance between native insects um, and native plants to the point that neither um, native plants are palatable, but native insects cannot or don't typically destroy native plants. Uh, but when it comes to um, non-native plants, a lot of times certain insects, some of them non-native that we've introduced, um, they will uh, decimate um, our non-native agricultural plums, peaches, which requires them to be protected by pesticides and fungicides. So there's some examples of insects and diseases like emerald ash borer and the chestnut blight being brought from other continents, decimating our native trees and American chestnuts. But outside of those transcontinental importing of non-native insects and pathogens, native plants really don't need protection from elements of their own ecosystems. Um, in fact, they are working. They are a working part of the ecosystem, which actively contributes through being a part of the food chain. This is a difference between non-native agriculture and native agriculture ecosystem. Uh, non-native plants were almost competing with the ecosystem just to keep them protected um, and keep them um, alive and healthy 
uh, whereas non-native plants are in balance and more at peace with the ecosystems as opposed to at war. Um, so non-native plants, uh, agricultural plants, um, in comparison for them to survive and produce maximum yields, they greatly benefit from chemical applications of pesticides and fungicides. Um, and this is once again, they lack the co-evolved co uh, relationships with our insects, fungi, and bacteria. Uh, when it comes to insect biomass and lower food chain support, um, because this agricultural system is based in native plants, and we've kind of covered this, so I'll just cover this briefly. Um, uh, the energy transfer um, is in more of a sustainable, non-decimating way from the plant roots, stems, sap, leaves, flowers. Our native insects struggle to utilize non-native agricultural plants in this way due to the lack of coevolution, uh, making agricultural suitable habitat for insects um, is a great first step to restoring biodiversity within our current agricultural dead space. So those first few slides were pretty heavy in information and um, I'm going to attach a little transcript which is basically notes for those um, few but these the rest of the slides are going to be a lot lighter um, in concepts but uh, that laid a good foundation for our talk. So what's left after harvest? A lot of things, a lot of um, People, when I talk about indigenous, indigenous agriculture, they're like, uh, well, if we eat all the nuts and the fruit, like, uh, what really is there left? Um, so, insects transfer energy up the food chain through eating decaying leaf matter, live leaf matter, um, or living leaf matter, uh, roots and root extracts, um, stem and stem extracts, which is basically plant plant juices, the the liquids flowing through the cambium um, and decaying wood. When it comes to insect biomass, which is a part of the foundation of all ecosystems, insects don't necessarily rely on the seeds, nuts, and fruits that we would be harvesting from this agricultural system. Um, even with root crops and leaf crops, uh, native insects can still utilize, utilize these plants before harvest um, and with root crops, they can utilize the leaves and the stems. And in some cases, even after harvest, um, with leaf crops, they can still utilize the roots and the stems. Uh, native rodents, which are important for transferring energy up into higher life forms as well, will also thrive more in a perennial native system when compared to any other form of agriculture. So here's a few potential biodiverse forms of indigenous agriculture. Uh, there's savanna formats, which has become known as agroforestry. Um, 30 to 70 percent native tree or shrub cover, and these would have edible fruit, nut, or leaf um, producing crops. Um, and 30 to 70 percent would be native herbaceous agriculture, a mix of um, annual and perennial uh, natives uh, and we're going to cover a lot of plants for the majority of the presentation. Um, this allows for maximum plant diversity per acre uh, supporting maximum biodiversity per acre. Um, 30 to 40 percent um, there's, this is another uh, land formation 30 to 40 percent native tree shrub cover um, and around that, which is this is more like a very open savanna, um, native prairie as lightly stocked grazing land. There is a grazing type called uh, land land management type called patch bird grazing, and this is being studied in Nebraska right now through the Nature Conservancy. And there are studies have shown that at the right stocking rate. Um, native or cows can actually increase biodiversity uh, when in the patch burn grazing system on native prairie um, if it's stocked at just the right rate. Uh, and if you just Google uh, Nature Conservancy Nebraska 
and the name Chris Hetzler. Uh, you should be able to find that PDF. Um, if not, I can just link it into the email um, that will follow this presentation. So large monocultures of native plants would not be considered biodiverse forms of indigenous agriculture. There's plants that like sunchokes, um, Jerusalem artichokes, big root crops that some people may be tempted to plant an acre of and become more like a small scale, what would be equivalent to like a potato farmer. But those are not the types of land management um, with invasive plants or with native plants that we're looking for to increase biodiversity. An acre of Jerusalem artichoke is better than an acre of corn for um, native uh, biodiversity, but uh, we can do a lot better than monocultures. So uh, these systems are moving away from monocultures into pretty biodiverse um, uh, plant formations per acre. So how indigenous agriculture looks in metropolitans. Uh, primarily edible native plantings um, designed and maintained to engage the population, preferably at places of gathering. So schools, workplaces, um, campuses like uh, college campuses that have enough land, uh, churches, public parks, public places, anywhere where people, people gather, if we can create um, well aesthetically presented um, native plantings with a lot of pollinator lively native plants, uh, these are the types of plantings that can open up people's minds to a reality that hasn't been seen on this country, um, in this country since settlement. Um, our colonization. Primary, primarily edible native plantings designed and maintained within our yards in replace of lawns. Uh, this would create the opportunity for our community or, or family engagement with indigenous foods. Uh, just growing patches of this, this, and that and making them part of the annual family Thanksgiving or whatever. These are other opportunities to for indigenous agriculture to start taking root within metropolitan landscapes. So in these settings, designing with aesthetics in mind is essential. There are so many examples of people who want to make pollinator gardens, uh, which is great, but the way they are designed and aesthetically appear is a turnoff to the public uh, because working with uncultivated native plants requires an extreme amount of expertise and understanding on how to arrange them in aesthetically pleasing ways that are acceptable to the public. Uh, and without that expertise, we make a lot of messes that we enjoy and love, but the public hates. And that's actually negative um, for this movement. When you have these pollinator gardens or edible plant gardens that the average person is almost appalled by aesthetically, um, the cultural work, you're almost doing the cultural work in a negative way and creating enemies to the movement or even further disconnection or negativity towards what people are perceiving as nature, um, which is really just a, a poorly designed garden. Um, whereas a uh, most plants, like when you see a native prairie, like in Adams County or um, up in the Darby Plains region, west of Columbus, uh, the arrangements of those plants naturally is aesthetically beautiful. So it's almost as if um, you're, you're now creating a perception of nature that doesn't even represent um, the aesthetic beauty that is inherent in our ecosystems, uh, which is negative cultural, the negative to this cultural work I'm trying to describe. So this next section is all about native plants with agricultural acquability. These are the highest potential. There's, uh, on my indigenous farm, which I'll talk about at the end of this presentation, there's tons of um, na native plants that are edible. 
um, but only certain ones can be grown in full sun and only certain ones are pretty ready to be like grown and harvested um, in a farm setting and some aren't um, due to just their natural being. Uh, these plants that I'm going to briefly cover, um, these have the highest potential um, and like they can be applied in their current state right now. So we'll start out talking about trees of indigenous agriculture, fruits, nuts, and leaves. Uh, Dunstan chestnuts. Um, so Dunstan chestnuts have the highest amount of American chestnut genetics within the hybrid. Um, we don't yet have American chestnuts, um, or we're not 100% sure that we have American chestnuts that are blight resistance, blight resistant. Uh, but we do have these Dunstan chestnuts, which are basically the closest thing to a blight resistant, 100% blight resistant American chestnut. Um, I'm not sure of the genetic percentage, but um, these trees grow more upright um, and Chinese chestnuts grow more like a, like a Bradford pear, like they're short and lollipop shape. They grow wide and stay short. Um, and um, these ducks and chestnuts, they grow straight up in the air. They create a chestnut shell that's a little bit darker than Chinese chestnuts, a darker brown. And these are the uh, Dunstan chestnuts when they um, are boiled. What you do is you boil the skin and you, um, you boil the skin and they kind of peel off. And I'm not really sure how to prepare these guys. Uh, some people eat them raw, but the nutritional content of these is similar to a potato or corn um, as opposed to a nut. Um, nuts are really high in fats and proteins, and they range anywhere between 550 calories per 100 grams and 750 calories per 100 grams. Um, low end would be um, acorns because they're more starchy. High end would be hickory nuts and pecans because they're more uh, fat, fatty, oily. Um, whereas chestnuts are around, they're more similar to corn. They're around 300 calories per 100 grams. Uh, so they're more like a starchy, um, starchy nut, um, the most starchy nut um, in comparison, as opposed, opposed to high in protein and fat. So oaks are one of the most ecologically supportive native trees in our ecosystems. Uh, Doug Tallamy has studied that they support the most widest diversity of caterpillars, but caterpillars aren't necessarily... Um, the foundation the insect of our ecosystem is a web of insects that um, transfer energy from plants into higher life forms uh, but it does indicate that they are pretty important um, so the edible part of oaks is the acorn um, what makes them bitter is a compound called tannins and that is leached out in different ways and those make um, once the acorns are made into flour and leached of tannins, it makes what's called acorn flour. And this can be used in different types of bread products or, um, well, that's basically it, different types of bread products. Here's a few different pictures. Some people make them into pancakes, cupcakes, uh, straight bread. If you make it uh, with a straight, um, if you make it with 100% acorn flour, it becomes pretty thick. Um, which is fine um, as long as you know what you're doing in the kitchen with it. Uh, this is a pecan bread, pecan banana bread on the left and a acorn bread on the right. So you can kind of see uh, the different colors that the two different types of native nuts create. Uh, in a indigenous agricultural system, you could replace the banana with pawpaw pulp um, or potentially persimmon pulp, um, which would give a much different flavor than, um, than pawpaw or banana. So hickory and pecans, um, they are the highest, um, 
first of all, pecans, they are hickories in the sense that they're in the same genus, Caria. Um, and since they're so high in fats and oils, uh, they are pretty much the highest, uh, most energy dense food you can eat. Um, the only food I found that's more dense than hickories, pecans, um, per hundred grams is literally whale blubber, which is just eating straight fat. Um, and, uh, so hickories and pecans, they're about twice as many calories as corn, which is plus 700 calories. Corn's about 350 calories per 100 grams. Um, this is a bitter nut hickory. So bitter nut hickories require leaching like acorns. Uh, but these are shell bark hickories, uh, which do not require leaching. Uh, you can go through the time of learning how to crack them open and eat their kernels this way. Uh, but, um, and this is the, this is a split half of, I believe a pig nut hickory. Um, but, uh, what uh, some indigenous tribes did was they just crushed them, um, up, which starts to separate the nut meat from the shell. And it's a lot quicker than picking our, um, it's a lot quicker than doing this. Uh, and they boil them for simmer for 12 to 24 hours. And um, that creates a broth that infuses all of the fats and proteins um, and minerals of the nut meat into the broth. Um, and some of the nut meat will flip to the top and some of the shells will stay, or all of the shells will stay at the bottom. Uh, but that's the quickest way to consume uh, hickory nuts in the, the least um, intensive, energy intensive way. So American persimmons are interesting. A lot of uncultivated fruits um, are fruits with little cultivation, have more, and this is true of vegetables as well, have more nutrition density than their cultivated counterparts. So if you compare the American persimmon to the Asian persimmon, the Asian persimmon has been cultivated for, um, I don't know how long, but a pretty long time. And its calories per 100 grams, I believe, are about in the 70s or 80s um, per 100 grams. Whereas the American persimmon, which hasn't been cultivated much at all, um, it is around 130 calories per 100 grams. So what does that mean? The more calories a fruit concentrates, um, the more food and the more agriculturally applicable the food becomes. Because um, we're still talking about fielding, feeding um, hundreds of millions of people. Um, so this is actually, the American persimmon is actually the second most calorie dense fruit uh, probably due to its little cultivation. Um, it's uh, the number one most calorie dense fruit isn't really comparable to persimmon because it's a totally different type of fruit, avocado. Um, and I think it's around 140 or 150 calories per 100 grams. Uh, but the American persimmon is actual berry um, in definition. Uh, so avocados, comparing avocados to any type of berry is kind of unfair. They're just different types of foods. So persimmon is pretty much the most calorie dense fruit um, outside of avocados. They're 24 more calorie or energy dense than potatoes. Potatoes are about 90 uh, calories per 100 grams. Uh, so uh, it just shows you some of the potential of energy that could come from just this native fruit tree for sustenance. Uh, one thing that I want to try with the persimmons that I haven't tried before is um, in places where maples are not very common or you just don't own any, um, trying to make a fruit syrup out of the persimmons. Um, these, some of these cultivars like Yates um, and uh, Proc, um, they produce pretty large persimmons that are kind of the size of small tomatoes and they're super, super sweet. 
And uh, I believe that um, if you do it right, you could probably make a nice fruit syrup um, substitution from them um, instead of boiling uh, hundreds of gallons of maple sap down. So wild plums are about 90 calories per 100 grams. And this is just the one set or two sets or however many sets of wild plums that was tested for the, the nutrition data uh, website, uh, nutrition data self. So if you test every single colony throughout the country, there's going to be a spectrum. Uh, but for whatever colonies that they tested, um, they're around 90 calories per 100 grams. And these are outstanding numbers for fruits. These 90 calories are 130 for persimmon. Cultivated fruits are anywhere between, like if you look at tomatoes, um, they're probably, I'm not sure the numbers, but it's going to be less than 50 calories per 100 grams. And uh, uh, cultivated plums in the store, those are about 50 um, calories per 100 grams. So wild plums are almost double the amount of calories uh, per 100 grams. And there's over six species native to this Midwest region we're talking about. When we talk about like pollinator conservation, uh, wild plums, they bloom about the same time as spring ephemerals in early April through much of the Midwest. Um, spring ephemerals are largely lacking from the landscape due to lack of forests that also have a non-invasive understory. So wild plums um, are pretty important to early arising uh, po native pollinators uh, because of that. Uh, these, uh, I'm growing a lot of these in my nursery this year, um, about 150. And uh, on my future indigenous farm, I plan on uh, collecting uh, scion wood, which are cuttings um, and grafting uh, somewhere about 75 uh, different wild plums from 75 different colonies uh, just to create a wild plum orchard, uh, which I think will be a pretty cool thing for uh, just conservation of the species and distributing the seeds out. A lot of wild plums are being outcompeted by autumn olive and honeysuckle right now, especially in my local region. And uh, they are so far separated from each other because of the invasive shrub edge that they're not even close enough to cross pollinate. So a lot of wild plum colonies that I find locally uh, do not produce fruit because they're too isolated from the next colony due to just hundreds and hundreds of feet of honeysuckle and um, autumn olive separating them. So this is a cool species to conserve and spread more seed out into protected land, but it's also a agriculturally um, significant species for indigenous agriculture. Blooms white in April here. It'll be covered in all kinds of pollinators. And there's just a bucket of wild plums. They can, they can be as small as this one here, which is probably a little bit bigger than a dime, and they can be a little bit bigger than a quarter. Um, some people kind of make a weird face when I say the size of them, but wild plums are directly related to cherries. Um, they're in the same genus. If you just think of it as a large cherry, honestly, it's, it's really not much of a difference. But um, uh, to get that cultivated size European plum or Asian plum, uh, Prunus domestica, uh, it took hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years to get that size. And you end up with a fruit that has half the calories as this and a lot less um, mineral and vitamin uh, concentration. So this is far by or by far superior. Here's just some more wild plums hanging up in the tree. When you get wild plums next to each other and close enough to each other, they can be really prolific. But if they're far away from each other, there'll be very little fruit um, and um, there are no fruit at all. Uh, pawpaws we all know of. Uh, this is a pawpaw in fall color. Um, and there's the pawpaw fruit. Um, it's, they're really, when it comes to pawpaw cultivation, um, they can benefit from hand pollinating, especially if you only have a few of them. Uh, if you just have like two or three, a lot of their pollinators 
are they need the forest environment beetles and certain flies they need the forest environment intact to be of good population uh, to pollinate pawpaws so once we stick them into our suburbs which are disconnected from the forest um, a lot of times they don't fruit as much as they could uh, due to lack of pollinators uh, this is the pawpaw pulp, which can be frozen. Frozen. This can be a complete replacement for bananas um, using freezing. Um, and this is service berry. Service berries, when it comes to berries, it's pretty high too. Like if you compare service berry, which is about 80 calories um, per 100 grams, uh, which is pretty high for a fruit, um, to something like a cultivated strawberry. Um, which is around 45 calories, I believe, per 100 grams. Um, it's it's just a lot more energy dense. Um, a lot of cultivated fruits, honestly, if you were to sustain yourself off of them, like bananas and um, cultivated grapes, you would be eating pounds and pounds and pounds of those a day. Um, whereas these uncultivated fruits like service berry and pawpaw and wild plum, and uh, persimmon or persimmon would be a case of less cultivated not uncultivated um, they uh, they just require since they're that much more nutrient dense they would just require less um, eating of them to sustain yourself these are the service berries they're basically ripe when they're red but they're also ripe when they're blue um, it just changes the flavor uh, profile but uh, you would have to plant a decent amount of them, like five, um, to make sure that you have enough for uh, the birds and yourself. Because this is one species that uh, you have to compete with wildlife um, a little bit more. With wild plums and um, even pawpaws to an extent, to an extent. But with wild plums and um, persimmon. Uh, those are pretty easy to pick up off the ground. Uh, I believe that um, the persimmon falling to the ground and the um, wild plums falling to the ground when they're ripe, um, that, I believe that they have a co-evolution with bear as one of their major distributors. Bear are really attracted to sweet fruits, unlike a lot of other native animals so much. Um, so when you see wild plums out in the wild, um, a lot of their fruits just fall to the ground and rot. And um, that indicates to me that their main distributor is missing from the ecosystem. And possums, raccoons, skunks aren't necessarily really going after these persimmon and wild plums um, in a high amount. But I do believe if we had bear in the landscape that these fruit would be um, pretty well distributed again. But what that means for us, since we don't have bear in the landscape, um, these are pretty easy to harvest fruits. This is a really bad picture of red mulberry. Uh, red mulberry has a more elongated fruit than white mulberry. A lot of people think that they've had red mulberry, um, but the reality is, at least in the areas that I've traveled, uh, red mulberry is a lot less common than white mulberry. Um, white mulberry has a glossier leaf. Red mulberry has a really rough leaf. Um, and um, and once you see enough red mulberry, you can clearly see the difference between white and red. The white mulberry has a less elongated fruit um, and it might be slightly wider uh, due to that. Uh, some people say the red mulberry tastes better than the white mulberry, but the red mulberry definitely likes to grow on wood edges and canopy openings, where white mulberry spreads into floodplain openings and pretty much any urban area. White mulberries just grow like weeds. Um, the problem with white mulberries, not only are they invasive, um, they hybridize with the red mulberry, which threatens the species um, as creating a hybrid between the China, or I believe white mulberries from China, the Chinese uh, mulberry and the American, um, you can lose the American um, species uh, if it becomes over hybridized. 
So American lindens uh, have edible leaves throughout May. Um, you can eat them um, in uh, as late as July in August. They just become more fibery and a little bit more bitter. But when you harvest them in May and June, um, they're really soft and they have no bitterness. Um, what you would do to put American linden into an indigenous agricultural system, uh, these sucker really well. So what you could do is allow it to grow up pretty, probably to about 20 to 30 feet um, and then cut it at a certain height, maybe 6 to 8 feet um, off the ground, um, which will create um, intense branching at that point um, that would be harvestable. Um, I'm not too educated about coppicing. Uh, so you might coppice it lower, like three feet off the ground to create branches lower. Um, and uh, it'll, it might sucker in response to losing its top as well. Um, so what, what getting greens from trees means is um, it's a perennial leaf crop. Uh, that is probably, it could be, no one's really done the nutrition data on linden. But when it comes to perennial plants, um, they tend to concentrate a lot of uh, minerals in particular in their leaves, uh, like grape leaves, which we'll talk about later. But um, yeah, so the American linden is just a perennial form of a leaf crop. Uh, and that's what it could be used as. And if you harvest it right and manage it right, it can still flower, uh, which supports a lot of different pollinators. And you're not going to harvest all of the leaves, so certain insects are going to utilize uh, the remaining leaves as well. Uh, so it'll still be a functioning part of the ecosystem. These are like lower leaves that are suckering um, off of the bottom of a tree. So... Um, they tend to be really wide when they sucker at the bottom of a tree and smaller at the higher parts of the canopy. Hybrid hazelnuts um, have the potential to be as productive as soybeans per acre. Um, calorie wise, they're about twice as dense as soybeans. Um, maybe a little bit less than twice as dense. I can't quite remember. I believe soybeans are in the 300 range and I know hazelnuts are around 700 calories uh, per 100 grams, but soybeans might be in the 400 range. But anyways, significantly more calories uh, than soybeans, um, and uh, mineral content um, is superior as well uh, compared to soybeans. Uh, so the reason why um, with chestnuts, that I promote hybrids is because we just don't have any for sure American chestnut uh, strains that are 100% sure that you know they're going to be blight resistant. And then with hybrid hazelnuts, what you do is uh, what you can get from hybrid hazelnuts is they're going to be part American and part European. So the European have because it's been cultivated for uh, hundreds of years, perhaps thousands of years. Um, it has thinner shells and larger kernels. The American hazelnut, if it were given that type of attention in breeding programs, we could have a similar production, but we just don't because the American hazelnut hasn't been cultivated in that way. So hybridizing the American hazelnut of the European gives the European hazelnut um, blight resistance um, to, a, to a blight that I think it's called Eastern filbert blight. Um, that is a native uh, blight that the American hazelnut is naturally resistant to. Uh, the American hazelnut is also more cold hardy than the European hazelnut. So what you get is cold hardiness and disease resistance from the American, and then you get bigger kernels and thinner shells from the European, and you have this nice kind of compromise, uh, half native, half non-native um, really productive uh, perennial nut crop. These are going to start, in, on ideal sites, these are going to start pumping out nuts in five years um, and um, less ideal sites upwards to eight to ten years. And if you compare that to chestnuts, which really start pumping out nuts around probably about 12 to 15 years, 
are oaks and hickories and pecans. Um, those would start pumping out around um, 18 to 25 years, depending on the site and how well they're cared for. Uh, this is just a more quicker uh, return on investment hybrid hazelnuts compared to any other nut. And these are the hazelnuts. You can make hazelnut fire, uh, flour or meal out of them or hazelnut oil. They're really high in fats and oils. Um, so here's a brain break. If I were to give this presentation live, um, this is where we would take an intermission. Um, you can pause or continue on, whatever you want to do. Uh, so what's left, which is of what I'm about to go into, are the lower levels of indigenous agriculture, the herbaceous plants. And what I mean by lower levels, I mean literally height-wise lower levels as opposed to trees and shrubs. So we're going to talk about plants that, herbaceous plants primarily, that produce roots, seeds, and more edible fruits and vegetables, which we haven't talked much about. So these are some of the highest potential root crops that we have. Um, Jerusalem artichokes, those are, or those are, those have been cultivated. A lot of these cultivars have been found growing in the wild. Um, so they're what you call natural selections, as opposed to um, some cultivars, which are hybrids between two specific plants that someone controlled and um, did a controlled cross-pollination with to produce um, what they thought would be a superior plant um, with uh, superior uh, crop. But uh, the sun tokes are mostly just natural selections found out in the wild um, and then some of them are productions of crossbreeding. Um, groundnuts, um, Apios, Americana, uh, those are a legume and they have pretty good potential. I look at them more as, um, a perennial bean crop, um, cause they can, when, when multiple individuals are near each other, they can produce a decent amount of bean, edible beans. Um, and one, a root crop that you would harvest, uh, periodically. So as opposed to harvesting it every year, like sun chokes, perhaps every two to three years, um, while keeping the bean production as uh, part of the crop too. So it's a legume that has edible roots. Um, so we'll talk about that. Wild potato vine um, has some potential. It needs cultivation, um, but in its raw form as it is can be used. Um, and we'll talk about these other species. So uh, sunchokes are probably the most productive native root crop, but they're also the most cultivated um, and there's a lot of cultivars already available, so that kind of makes them the most productive as well. Um, they're a sunflower that gets anywhere between six feet tall in drier soils, upwards to 12 to 15 feet tall in deep, moist bottomland soils. Uh, they're native to um, moist, like moist swales inside of prairies. Um, as well as uh, low elevation plains like river flood plains and bottomlands, and um, and they really like a silty sandy soil, um, and they grow really vigorous in that situation. At the end of the year, they're well. First of all, helianthus that genus supports one of the highest amounts of uh, caterpillars from Doug Ptolemy's uh, research as. I've pointed out, and um, on top of that, um, the helianthus uh, flowers, the sunflowers, at the end of the year are going to support a lot of different pollinators, and then rodents, as well as goldfinches and a few other birds, will use the seeds, the little sunflower seeds that get produced in the flowers. And then after all that has happened, you're going to have a lot of biomass, which is going to be decomposed by native insects, so um, that's contributing to the food chain again. And you're harvesting part of the uh, root crop each year, which are these bulbous. They have a lot of different forms of um, Jerusalem artichokes. So some of them are thinner and longer. Some of them are reddish colored. Some of them are fat and long. Some of them are bulbous shaped like this. So uh, groundnut, um, 
this can be found in wetlands or moist bottomland soil as well. Um, it is a legume. Um, I talked a little bit about this. Uh, pollinators love this plant. It's slightly fragrant and maroon color. It blooms in late July and August, and um, uh, it takes you know any, it takes twice as long to grow these roots as it would to p potatoes or sunchokes, but um, the nutritional density is twice as much as potatoes. So um, it kind of pays off for itself. And in the meantime, if you um, cultivate it correctly, you can get a bean crop off of this legume as well. And this is a picture from a Facebook friend of um, an APOS root that has grown for probably anywhere between three to four years um, and has a really large size. Evening primrose has a lot of potential because it's a biennial. Um, so this plant is going to put on a, and it has uh, different edible parts more than the root. So in a cultivated situation, these roots would be bigger. Um, they may be about an inch and a half to two inches thick towards the top and get thinner as they go down as a like kind of like a carrot shape. Um, and um, if these first year roots were allowed to grow a uh, second year as a biennial, they would shoot up these flowers which are pollinated by different moths at nighttime. And they're really open at night and in the morning. And they're also pollinated by bees in the morning before they close up for the day. Kind of like spider warts. Um, except I don't know if spider warts are pollinated at night. So the evening primrose can grow out of just a little bit of rock. It won't create a large root in that situation. The point is with a lot of these native plants, if you get them in the right situation, there's no irrigation, no fertilizer, um, no pesticides, no fungicides, uh, none of these things that a lot of non-native plants or uh, plants that are in industrial agricultural formats need to produce. Um, they really don't need these things. They just need native soil, sunlight, water. Um, and an average amount of um, nutrients. And as much nitrogen as we've loaded into the nitrogen cycle, it's literally raining from the sky at this point. So um, a lot of our ecosystems are over fertilized and a lot of our farm fields are over fertilized as well. Um, this is uh, Ipomia pandorata, wild potato vine. So some of these native plants, since they haven't been cultivated, they have their natural defenses intact to keep them protected from predation. So um, this is one of those plants where over time you could cultivate the Apomia pandorata, you could cultivate the toxicity out of the skin of the root. It has a purgative compound that causes you to throw up. And what that does is it naturally protected it from mammals um, and other um, animals that would try to eat the root. Um, and it did very well in that way. But humans, all we have to do is boil it, uh, which leaches the uh, purgative compound out of the skin and then bake it like a potato. These roots, if you let them grow for years and years, um, they can get well over 10 pounds. Um, some people claim they found 20 pound uh, uh, Ipomia pandorata roots, uh, wild potato vine roots. Uh, but realistically, if you're letting them grow one to two years, they're, they're going to exceed one pound in weight, and then you would harvest. Um, and in the meantime, it puts on a lot of biomass above ground, which once again supports insects as these decompose, which supports higher life forms. And uh, that's in the form of really thick, vigorous vines, as well as it's going to support a lot of pollinators. A lot of different types of native bees just race in and out of these flowers when they're blooming in July and August and early September. It's really, really vigorous. Um, and that's a good thing. It, Vigorous plants like uh, Jerusalem artichoke and um, wild potato vine, that just means they're creating a lot of biomass. And when you start to talk about sustainable agriculture, you start to talk about um, plants that produce a lot of biomass, which is maximum um, organic matter 
introduced back into the soil or on top of the soil, which really feeds that insect foundation and fungal and bacteria foundation of ecosystems. So uh, these are uh, Liatra spicata, um, blazing star bulbs, um, or what they call, I think they're called corms, um, is the more scientific term. And uh, the other Liatris that I will not try to pronounce at the bottom of the screen um, is, will also produce a nice sizable um, root on it fairly quickly. Uh, so how I imagine uh, these were roasted, slow roasted, like Jerusalem artichokes um, by indigenous people. And that is because they have a carbohydrate called inulin, which is indigestible to humans and bacteria digest it, which creates a lot of gas. Uh, so if sun chokes and uh, blazing stars, you slow roast them at a low temperature, uh, which converts the inulin into sugar or different types of digestible carbohydrates. Uh, and then they become, the energy becomes accessible to us as humans, um, and it breaks down out of that inulin form of carbohydrate. So uh, how I envision the liatris being cultivated over time, um, specifically these two liatris for the Midwest, um, is... Um, just like you have seed potatoes, um, when you plant a potato farm, you would have seed liatris bulbs that would um, be able to produce flowers their first year at this age of maturity, um, which contributes a lot to the insect biomass, particularly just with pollinator support. Um, and then after that first year, uh, you would uh, harvest the crop in the fall. And that would be uh, one root crop. So this is a root crop that isn't, it's edible. It's not very well talked about. Some people taste, say it tastes somewhat like a carrot. Um, but um, this one has potential if we would give it some attention. And this is a field of the uh, prairie blazing star, which is this Latin name that I'm not going to try to pronounce out in Minnesota growing in its native environment. So here's a few other high potential crops. Um, these are not root crops, uh, but uh, one of them will be because it's a vegetable crop that is also a root crop. So this is Rubus pascus. This is more native to southern Midwest. Uh, on the USDA maps, it's claimed to not be native to Ohio, but it is native to Kentucky. I found about seven populations north of the Ohio River. So um, either over time, it's jumped the river um, from Kentucky to Ohio, or it's just always been here and never recorded um, into herbariums. So the Chesapeake Blackberry creates the largest blackberry, a wild blackberry that we have um, in its uncultivated form. Also in its uncultivated form, it is treacherous. It has a thousand thorns um, and the thorns are thick, they're long, they're curled. Um, it's just a dangerous plant um, compared to most blackberries. Um, this is like a 10 foot or 12 foot tall thicket of uh, Rubus pacus, pascus at East Fork State Park. Um, and um, they create really large blackberries, like I said. And for me, I'm not really big on the tartness of the other wild blackberries that taste it. But if you pick these at the right time, these are like 90 to 80% sweet, 10 to 20% tart. They have a really, really good flavor. And um, the cool thing about these is they can grow in anywhere between well-drained soil and literal wetland soil. What they're growing in, if you look here, the sweet gum, what they're growing in in East Fork State Park is what's called the, uh, what I call my reforestation guide, the acidic wetland forest. So it has a high water table from the Illinois and glaciation, and it's also really acidic. So the water table is often puddling 
um, as in the spring above the soil level. And then for the rest of the year, it's just super moist and saturated. So these blackberries can grow in really poorly drained soil, which I think is an attribute, as well as well-drained soil, uh, which I found them in other situations. Uh, Riverbank grape, Vitis riparia. The cool thing about grape leaves is they're edible. But most grape leaves, they have so much tannins in them that you have to leach them. And then you use that cooked form um, to use to to use the grape leaf. And, uh, excuse me. And um, so um, when you leach it, it leach out a lot of the minerals and destroy the heat destroys a lot of the vitamins. The cool thing about Vitis riparia, at least the populations that I found around Cincinnati, is they um, have such a low level of tannins, um, I'm assuming, that they, uh, when you taste the leaf raw, there's no astringency, there's no bitterness. Uh, it just has this lemon flavor without the bite. So if you could just take the bite out of a lemon and just leave the flavor, that's the flavor of these leaves. And the grapes hold the same flavor, except they have a little bit more of a bite. Um, than the leaves but um so the grapes what this gives us the opportunity to do is since grape leaves have um, more mineral concentration than most dark leafy greens uh, in certain ways especially when it comes to calcium potassium and iron uh, which americans are uh, deficient in it has more concentration of those than uh, broccoli leaves, uh, kale, and spinach, if you look it up, uh, you have the potential to have this super energy and nutrition dense uh, plant that is perennial, which means you don't have to plant it every year and is drought tolerant as well and is super vigorous. And setting these up, they can grow 20 feet a year per stem. So you're going to have maximum crop value here yield wise leaf when it comes to the leaves you're going to have maximum nutrition in certain ways compared to our agricultural leafy greens um, and grape leaves uh, the ones that you don't eat some will be utilized by insects uh, you do not have to eat the grape uh, fruit um, but they are nice um, what i would do uh, with the grapefruit is uh, probably dehydrate them and grind the seeds into grapeseed flour um, as well as the fruit. Uh, grapeseed flour is just one thing you can do with grape seeds as well as pressing them for grapeseed oil. So this plant, Vitis riparia, riverbank grape, it just has so much potential as an indigenous crop in different ways. And if you raise chickens, you can just feed all the grapes to the chickens and uh, they'll handle them just fine. And um, I'm looking into uh, feeding the grape leaves to chickens too as part of their greens. So you can just set up, this is like a typical professional orchard design where you get four by fours and you run a uh, grape line orchard in between them. Um, you can make these lines as well as the distance in between the posts as, as much as 12 to 14 feet. Um, and, uh, at these different points, there's these eyes that you feed them in through the post that holds the tension and keeps the line from slacking. Um, but seven feet, feet would be pretty short. Um, uh, I personally will go all the way up to 16 feet above ground. Uh, Menards actually offers these 20 foot four by fours, uh, which you can, uh, sink about three and a half feet into the ground and then run these orchard lines and just create a ton of harvestable uh, vertical space uh, with the grape leaf lines grown 16 feet high above ground. These, um, you can, there's different ways to sort through the wild grapes. Um, they're pretty small, so I tend to not mess with them. I would make them uh, chicken food for sure. Uh, Vitis labrusca is a native grape to the Americas. It's been cultivated for a couple hundred years, I believe. And um, to, I said to the Americas, but I mean uh, to America. I did not mean South America. Um, so um, 
These grape leaves are nasty. You have to boil them. Uh, the only one I suggest for raw eating is Vitis riparia. Um, so Vitis labrusca has been cultivated into different uh, forms. Now these are going to have less calorie density and nutrition density than these little wild grapes. Uh, but these are still an applicable crop that you can fit into an indigenous agricultural system. If you manage it organically, then these leaves are going to support a lot of insect biomass as they decay and um, in their living form as well. And uh, more down south, you have Vitis, ooh, I don't know how to pronounce that. Anyways, you have this grape, and um, it can uh, fit a certain uh, role in indigenous agriculture as well if you're managing these organically. Uh, allowing insects to um, take in part with the uh, consuming part of the leaf biomass to contribute to the ecosystem. Passion flower is fun. It's mostly native to the south, but it comes up into Indiana, uh, Virginia, I believe West Virginia, Southern Ohio, um, definitely Southern Indiana and Illinois, Missouri. Um, this is a really vigorous herbaceous vine. Um, this is actually a true vine. This is probably too much information, but woody vines, they're not actual vines scientifically. Um, vines are herbaceous plants, and this is a true herbaceous vine, um, well, a true vine. And uh, these can leaves can be used medicinally. Uh, they contain a sedative compound called chrysin, which if you take on an empty stomach, um, through tea or through smoking, which doesn't require empty stomach. Um, it has a sedative effect on the body, um, as well as other medicinal effects. The bumblebee species, Bombus, love these flowers. It's, it's almost like these flowers are made for Bombus, and uh, they, they all come for them when they start blooming. Uh, really pretty, intricate flowers. Uh, when you get two passion flowers a lot of times people just plant one passion flower and then the fruit are empty and you step on them and they pop because they're hollow um, those weren't fertilized um, those weren't cross-pollinated i should say um, and when you get two passion flowers next to each other then they'll create these fruit which it's like a fleshy once you open up the pod it's like there's this juicy flesh around these brown seeds and uh, the most similar thing I could compare the ones I've tasted to is like if Capri Sun was like in a organic form or non corn syrup based form uh, it would taste somewhat like these passion flowers uh, so it's a really cool vigorous vine that produces nice fruit the other thing indigenous people cook the greens so if you imagine they have this sedative called chrysin in them but indigenous people figured out that if you cook these greens in fat um the uh fat neutralizes the chrysin so you can eat as much as these uh passion flower greens as you want as long as they're cooked with fat as part of the um pot herb or cooking uh cooking greens that you're making and uh, and that's why passion flower doesn't work on a full stomach. The chrysin either binds with food or something happens with food in that compound chrysin that prevents it from uh, getting to the brain. So um, for it to medicinally work, it should really be used on an empty stomach. Uh, stinging nettle is probably one of the most favorite greens um, for people who know about native edible plants. Um, apparently the flavor is one of the best. Um, to this, The barbs on stinging nettles um, are made out of hardened sap. So when you dry stinging nettle, the barbs break apart and are, they don't sting anymore. Or when you um, introduce stinging nettle to heat through sauteing or cooking like you would the passion flowers in a pot. Um, then the, uh, the hardened sap barbs um, fall apart as well, uh, which makes them completely edible. Um, I don't know about the nutrition quality of stinging nettle, but it is a dark leafy perennial green, so it's probably pretty good. 
Um, the other cool thing about stinging nettle, this stuff grows in dry or moderately dry prairies. Um, it grows on floodplains. Um, it grows um, in moist conditions as well as moderately dry conditions. So this plant, it can also handle partial shade, partial sun, but is most productive in full sun. This plant is um, super, when you compare it to growing kale or growing spinach or these other agricultural greens, this plant is just easy. It's super aggressive. It outcompetes other herbaceous plants. It runs underground through rhizomes, which creates these thick colonies. Um, and um, yeah, so this plant is just low maintenance to no maintenance. And you can harvest it, if you treat it kind of harshly, you can harvest it twice a year. I would harvest it once a year to allow a lot of regrowth, which will allow insects to uh, really utilize this plant after harvest from the regrowth to contribute more to the ecosystem. But you could harvest this up to twice a year. Um, amaranthus species. Um, now this picture is kind of a joke. Um, this is um, uh, amaranthus pulmeri, which is actually a native that has become invasive in agriculture. And there's a difference between being invasive in ecosystems and invasive in agriculture. Agriculture, soybean fields, corn fields, these are not ecosystems. They're, they're not really ecosystems. Uh, Amaranthus pulmeri um, is not going to uh, be invasive in a grassland ecosystem or a wetland ecosystem. Uh, but um, these plants, Amaranthus genus, are completely edible. So the tender stems, the leaves, and the seeds are all edible of amaranthus. The amaranthus that haven't become agricultural uh, weeds or amaranthus hybridus, um, these three that listed, I'm not going to try to pronounce those Latin names. Anyways, uh, those are the ones I've selected for the Midwest that are native to the Midwest that uh, indigenous people use as edible vegetables, uh, whether it's the stem leaf part or the edible seed part. So common milkweed is a plant we know as um, people who are interested in monarch butterflies. Uh, what we don't often know is um, this is one of the most versatile uh, vegetable crops we have. When it's arising in the spring, you can cut the top 8, 10 inches of growth that are really tender as a form of asparagus, a, an arising stem. And these plants are so robust that they can recover and still shoot up stems after that. Um, and some will even flower after getting their first eight inches cut off, which contributes to pollinators um, post-harvest. Um, and even if they do not bloom post-harvest, then uh, they still contribute as a larval host. Um, so um, the flowers and the flower buds, so the open flowers and the unopened flowers, are also a uh, form of vegetable crops that can be sautéed and cooked. Then the, um, the tender tops and the um, unopened flower buds uh, can also be sautéed. And as well, the immature flower pods can also be sautéed. Uh, so the common milkweed, even though we think of it as like a potentially toxic plant, uh, with the right preparation, um, this can be uh, one of the most um, uh, versatile multi-crop vegetables we can produce in the Midwest. And once again, you're not going to need to water this plant. Um, it's going to take care of itself. It, it really doesn't need you at all. Uh, so uh, we've talked about some of the higher potential, potential uh, native plants for agriculture. And uh, what these slides are, are just showing you some of the potential for other species that either require more work or they may need some cultivation, or I just didn't have enough time to uh, put them into this presentation. Uh, but in the Midwest, uh, 
um, nut and seed crops. Um, and these, this is also the list of crops that's going to be on my indigenous farm. So um, Dun Dunstan chestnuts, um, which are partly American, white oak, swamp white oak, bur oak, red oak, schumard oak, scarlet oak, hybrid hazelnuts. The American hazelnut with some cultivation and breeding can also be part of indigenous agriculture. Uh, black walnut, I'm not so sure about black walnut. Um, there's plenty of cultivars out there that are very productive, but there is uh, some type of canker that I'm not very well educated on that's introduced by a beetle that is wiping out populations of black walnut and is traveling from the west to the east. So I don't know about the long-term uh, survival of black walnut at this time, so I don't typically add it to my presentations. Um, shell bark hickory, shag bark hickory, sweet pig nut, and pig nut. Also, all, they all produce a decent amount of uh, nut meat per shell. Um, those would all probably be crushed up and boiled um, in broth form, and uh, or you can take the time to crack them. Uh, but uh, bitternut hickory um, has leachable tannins, so you can leach them just like the acorns, or you can press them for oil, um, which somehow leaves out the tannins and makes a nice hickory oil. Uh, and then some non-nut seed crops, you have Helianthus anus. This plant's been so cultivated, we don't really think of it as native anymore, but it is in a sense still native, um, even in its heavily cultivated form. Uh, and it does still support a lot of insect biomass, which is what we're after. Um, Apios americana through the beans, um, that's groundnut that we talked about. And a few amaranthus um, have the potential to be seed crops. The difference between indigenous agriculture and industrial agriculture is you're shifting corn, soybean, and wheat, which is a grass seed, um, two grass seeds being wheat and corn, and a soybean seed, which is a, a, a legume, a bean, um, to primarily nut crops. Um, and sunflower, which is an herbaceous or a forb, a wildflower seed. Um, so you're shifting from grass seeds and bean seeds to primarily sunflower seeds, nuts, and some amaranthus speed, which would be another wildflower-like seed. Uh, but there's not a lot of native beans that have a ton of potential. Um, and there's not a lot of native grasses that have a ton of potential. And really health-wise as a society, we should be moving more away from grains into these types of plants, um, which are healthier for humans to digest. Fruits. We have American persimmon cultivars, pawpaw cultivars, um, even straight species pawpaws are pretty productive, and uh, wild plums. Wild plums, in my opinion, they don't even need per, they don't even need cultivation. Um, you can select for like certain varieties that have outstanding flavor, but wild plums are just good as is, in my opinion. Um, passion flower, service berry, red mulberry, choke cherry. Indigenous people um, use these small cherries um, as fruit leather by crushing them up and exposing the seeds to sun, which broke down the um, uh, toxic compound that's within the cherry seeds. So then you get to consume the cherry seed and seeds are super nutrient dense. Um, and I believe the cherry, this cherry, uh, choke cherry seed has vitamin, uh, concentration of vitamin E in it, which is a little bit more rare than other vitamins. Uh, but as well as you still get to consume the dehydrated fruit um, that is the choke cherry. Uh, then you have the grapes, Vitis labrusca and uh, Roundtifolia cultivars. Um, currants, uh, I don't know too much about currants, but I've seen some that have a little bit of potential. Um, and Rubus pascus, uh, which is the Chesapeake blackberry, as well as the uh, black raspberries. Black raspberries, Rubus occidentalis has uh, a lot of um, cultivars already available that are really productive. So uh, dewberry is an interesting one for people who are into polycultures where you have like something like a chestnut that's putting out partial shade. You can grow dewberries on the edges of the canopy uh, 
in more of a savanna situation. And uh, it can also grow out in the full sun. The point is it's, it's productive in partial shade. Uh, so it kind of fills a little niche in polyculture things, uh, polyculture, um, agricultural for forms. So some vegetables that some few of these weren't in the presentations. We have common milkweed, blight goosefoot, um, red goosefoot, and those are um, related to... There's a few chinopodiums, this genus that are native, or not, a few that aren't not native, aren't native, but were widely used as a vegetable. These are related to those evening primrose. The shoot that comes up in the beginning of the second year can be harvested as a stem leaf crop, and then um, and then you can allow that uh, biennial to shoot up another shoot which will flower the second year. And in that case, you're treating it more as a vegetable crop and not harvesting the root because at the end of the second year, that root is thick and fibrous and uh, not as palatable um, as the beginning of the second year, which is when you would harvest it. Cutleaf coneflower is a rutabecchia that gets anywhere between six to 10 feet tall on floodplains and bottomlands and grow in partial shade. It can grow in a lot of shade, um, uh, but the shade of floodplains is different than the shade of upland forests. So um, the, in floodplains, the moisture availability is very high in the soil, and the uh, flooding uh, in a lot of floodplains creates a slightly broken can canopy where herbaceous plants can grow really thickly in between. So don't think that you can just plant this under a tree and it'll be just fine. Um, it can grow really well in full sun as well. Uh, very nice flavor. Um, uh, stinging nettle, we talked about the different amaranthus. Cow parsnip, Canadian licorice root, uh, this uh, polygonum, uh, and spiderwort surprisingly is was used as an indigenous vegetable or by indigenous people as a vegetable in its raw form as is um, just coming up in the spring the top eight ten inches um, cutting them flush off the ground as a vegetable crop uh, and uh, violet species which violet species they don't really put on a lot of biomass but in a polyculture system where you're filling all these niches um, violets uh, can fill a partial shade niche as an edible ground cover. So I'm only going to talk about, mention, read the, the root crops that we didn't talk about. So wild hyacinth, um, that's more of a forest plant, but when grown full sun or savanna plant, but when grown in full sun, it can produce a sizable bulb that is edible. Uh, Craiga, Craigia species, when grown in full sun, can produce, the tubers aren't large, but they can produce a lot of tubers um, in more of an agricultural setting. The thing about those is they're so small, they're not very competitive. Um, so you'd have to, with a lot of these indigenous plants, they hold their ground. This species is a specialist species, which grows in situations where other plants struggle to grow. So it doesn't really have to hold its ground in its natural environment and it can stay small. Uh, this plant would probably get overwhelmed in a lot of agricultural settings by weeds. Uh, and Claytona virginica, spring beauty, um, this plant is a pretty small spring ephemeral, so it would take multiple years to grow tuber, but when grown in full sun, these tubers can get a little bit about the size of a golf ball. Uh, most people, when they've dug them up, uh, they're probably the size of a marble uh, because they've been grown in the forest. Uh, but full sun, they can get about the size of a golf ball. Um, and the uh, next two are, um, I forget the common names for these, but uh, these grow in prairies and they have a small taproot that's edible. Uh, Allium, cernum, nodding wild onion, that's more of a culinary crop where you can harvest the onion vegetation as a culinary addition to an indigenous dish. But the actual bulb of allium is not too big. And that's because it's never really been cultivated like other onions um, that we have in our grocery stores.
So I'm going to quickly recap here. Some root causes of pollinator and biodiversity decline. Within the glaciated Midwest and the Mississippi River, uh, flood, river Plains, it's, the root cause is agricultural displacement of ecosystems. Um, in, in the 50s and 60s, there was a transition uh, between, um, we just started using a lot more ki chemicals in the 50s and 60s and really started moving towards what we now call industrial agriculture, where yes, we're maximizing crop yields, but we're also using um, a lot of pesticides and um, herbicides per acre and making these agricultural settings very spotless and clean um, in a sense of not having any other wild plants growing amongst these hundreds of millions of acres. Um, before the 50s and 60s, there was a little bit more biodiversity allowed in these rural settings due to more insect biomass contributing to the ecosystem. Uh, but with the present day state of insecticide and pesticide use, uh, these acres are basically dead. Um, so this is the root cause of pollinator and biodiversity decline, very intensive uh, chemical intensive agriculture, and the fact that these plants aren't native to begin with. Um, so a culture and population that is disinterested and disconnected from nature, um, that's the apathy that we experience. We wonder why our neighbors don't care that they have a pair that's spread a uh, uh, Bradford pear or Cleveland select pear that's contributing to spreading out and uh, taking over um, our remaining wild land and protected land. It's because they have really no true connection to nature. So there's no interest, there's no care, there's no action. Um, uh, and that is what we need to focus on as a population um, of people who do have a connection with nature and aren't apathetic and are motivated to listen to me speak about this stuff for an hour and a half. So uh, invasive plants spreading outward from metropolitans into preserves. And there's also significant, um, there's also often significant nature preserves and parks inside of metropolitans that also uh, would benefit directly from uh, removal of invasive species. These invasive species degrade what little is left. There's over 100 million acres already invaded by invasive species. The thing is, is <clears throat> the thing is, is uh, agricultural land, uh, just our tilled agricultural land, which is well over 400 million acres um, in the country, primarily mostly in the Midwest. Um, that is not going to be affected by invasive species in its current format because it's tilled, it's killed, it's dead. Um, there's no invasive species that's going to take over these cornfields, wheat fields. That's basically just dead land. What these invasive species are affecting are the remaining wild lands that we have, the remaining forests, the remaining savannas, the remaining prairies. Uh, this is what these um, uh, invasive species are affecting. So the fact that we've already decreased the protected land uh, throughout the Midwest, um, and then invasive species are degrading what's left, uh, it makes metropolitan invasive species removal um, a very important part of what we should focus on um, within with within like the reach of our power as people so some of the most effective actions through pollinator friendly and or edible native plantings uh, nurturing future conservationists this is cultural work um, and fostering local interests getting people interested in nature um, these this this cultural transition is necessary for a lot of things. Uh, people wonder why um, uh, we're not so active on climate change. Well, most of the culture really isn't so worried about climate change as some of the people who may be listening to this presentation. Um, they're not so connected to the earth 
to really understand uh, what is about to happen and what is already happening. Uh, working on fostering interest in nature is uh, the beginning of uh, really being able to um, support large-scale restoration and large-scale changes uh, that have real biodiversity effects, positive effects. Uh, promoting indigenous agriculture through demonstrations, planting for your family and or the community. Some community examples, once again, churches um, uh, have a lot of land around them. Schools often have a lot of land around them. And um, corporations often have a lot of land around them um, sometimes. Uh, these places where people concentrate are opportunities to raise interest. But once again, it requires a certain amount of expertise to make these plantings look good. And if you don't make them look good, then you have the opposite effect. You, you uh, have people who look at that like, oh, you're creating some form of nature and this is disgusting. Like we need to turn this back into a lawn. Uh, so if you don't do it in the right way, you actually have the opposite effect of what we're going towards, which is just creating cultural resistance towards nature um, and reinforcing people's ideas about it, negative ideas about it. And uh, continuing on with invasive species control and eradications from our metropolitans and preserves, if the majority of people were connected to nature, I guarantee you that nurseries would not be selling any potentially or already proven invasive plant. Um, the reason why nurseries still can sell invasive plants is because there's only a small amount of people who are even aware or care about this issue. So uh, I want to briefly talk about a project that I'm working on locally. Um, within a year, uh, I'm looking to purchase 10 to 15 acres. We're going to have over 80 native species on site. Uh, really, the only hybrids would be the hybrid hazelnuts and the hybrid chestnuts. The rest will be 100% native. And um, a lot of these will be culinary indigenous plants. Um, and then um, about 55 of them will be directly for food. Um, and some of them will just be for wildlife that really don't have much of a culinary or edible use to humans. And... Um, the food grown on this 10 to 15 acres won't feed a lot of people, but what it will do is it'll create the food needed to hold annual indigenous food festivals, which is my effort to create interest in our local ecosystems. Um, so we've all heard of the Pawpaw Festival in Ohio. Um, I want to create a festival that features at least 40 different native edible foods to really start teaching people and introducing people who may not have such a strong bond with nature um, through the culinary arts um, uh, about nature and starting to create that interest in nature through showing people um, these beautiful plants of our ecosystems. Uh, so that is basically the end of the presentation on indigenous agriculture, most effective actions for metropolitan people. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about my reforestation and agroforestry guide for Southwest Ohio and Southeast Indiana. Um, this is a 40 page document that um, is available through, if you email me, I can mail you a copy. Um, it's uh, it identifies and describes 10 different forest types based on soil pH, hydrology, topography, and uh, elevation. So um, what, what, we, uh, what I've done over the past three or four years is uh, using USDA web soil surveys and um, second growth and older growth forest remnants, um, I've figured out what uh, different tree formation, tree associations happen in different soil pHs, uh, hydrologies, topographies, and elevations. And combining all these different pieces of information together, um, I've been able to identify 10 different forest types that occur on specific uh, physical attributes, like I just um, 
discussed. So this basically lays out a guide to reforest based on your current site's physical attributes. Um, and even if you're not so interested in reforestation, this will be applicable to agroforestry as well. In the guide, there's GPS coordinated hike recommendations to see each forest type. You just type in the GPS coordinates and it will take you directly to the forest type and there's directions on what to look for and how to identify it. Um, it lists frequent and less frequent species for every forest type as well as under and those are canopy species as well as understory species as well and the most common invasive species for that forest type. Um, it also includes some natural history connected to how the forest formed based on the physical land attributes. So basically I talk about the glaciers and the rivers and the formation of the topography that creates the soil pHs, um, the uh, hydrology, topography, and elevation, which I'm referring to as the physical land attributes. So uh, there's also USDA pH maps that are identical to, identi uh, to topography maps, which further describe each forest type. So it gives you the soil pH map of a specific uh, topography map with a description of the forest type and how these um, how these physical land attributes create this forest type. Um, and the most important part is there's a how to apply this information section step by step in an order of restoration section, which will keep you from planting beaches and maples in full sun. Um, and if you're working with the open field, it'll say these species um, start first in order of restoration and maples and beaches and other species would come after the forest canopy has been established. Um, so um, this forest type or this reforestation guide is completed by a three page spreadsheet available on the website. If you go to pioneersprouts.com and then you click in the right hand corner, there should be a drop down menu. It says resources and uh, click the uh, reforestation spreadsheet. Um, that has tons of information per species organized into three pages of a spreadsheet. And it also has um, the forest types laid out per species between most frequent and less frequent, along with the third page being, um, uh, what is the third page? Oh, forest type indicators. So the forest type indicators, I've uh, used certain species in combination with each other can help you indicate or can help you diagnose a current forest type. Um, and even working with broken forest and open land, there's still certain indicators that indicate certain things, such as black gum and sassafras always indicate a pH of less than 6.8. Um, sometimes more acidic than that, or a um, or chigapin oak and bur oak and Kentucky coffee tree always indicate a pH of above 6.5, not necessarily always alkaline, but definitely above 6.5. So these kinds of pieces of information help you um, create a reforestation or agroforestry plan for your land based on what the land attributes would naturally promote, which is the most sustainable thing. It also contains um, a list of applicable native nut, seed, fruit, root, shoot, and leaf crops for this region, um, which is what you saw in these orange slides back here. So uh, that is the last piece of information I wanted to add to this presentation. Uh, this is my contact information. Uh, for now on, I'll be doing a lot of these virtual presentations, which have the ability to reach more people and people can um, listen to them at their own convenience. It's a lot more comfortable for me to do it in this way, which means I'll be producing more presentations per year. Um, and I think this is just a win-win format. You can leave your comments about the presentation on either the Facebook or the YouTube link to this presentation. Thanks for listening.